Good morning. Um, welcome or welcome back to CTAC. I'm Karen Cohoney and grateful for your presence and extremely grateful for the presence of these um, fantastic speakers that we heard yesterday, today again and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, on this second day of CTAC 12, we're addressing issues relating to food justice and guided by our speakers and the artworks, intersecting justice related to food with issues of sustainability, land rights, food sovereignty, and other issues. I'd like to thank you for coming, and I'd also like to acknowledge the support of our sponsors, and in particular the Patrimonio de Arte Contemporanea, um, which has been a wonderful host organization and organizer of this event. Please um, allow me to um, summarize very briefly, but it will take a couple of minutes, the uh, proceedings from yesterday's, from yesterday. And in a way, um, I think um, I'm following the lead of our um, own uh, topic, or shall I say, we're biting our own tail, since the call for uh, art and justice entails a few changes in the format of SITAP itself. So, most importantly, and different from previous years, we've brought together practitioners from various fields such as art, science, and politics, not just for these three days in Mexico City, but also for three extended residencies. The Estudio Citac, that happened in October, November, and just last week, and are directed by Lucia San Roman. This moves Citac from being a showcase of presenters to becoming a shared and extended research platform. It also acknowledges that in this globally connected world, significant contributions are made by the visiting speakers, but also right here in Mexico, and that these efforts need to be aligned. To the extent possible, we are also doing away with hierarchies between audiences and speakers, and for the luncheons, for instance, are all coming together as gourmets invested in the same uh, questions. And I think this is a good moment to thank Maria Bostock in particular for organizing the luncheons with Comilona, which is an independent organization that supports small-scale organic food producers and serves lunch out behind the theater. As I mentioned yesterday, but for you who are new to the conference today, I just want to briefly remind you that we had actually numerous conversations leading up to the conference on the topic of justice and decided that the issues most re resonant for the current moment would be justice related to issues of education, food and gender. Each topic is anchored by one project which serves as a case study and is also featured as part of the Estudio Citac, the residencies. And together they catalyze, we hope, new research, international understanding, and at times will result in in-depth strategy sessions. Yesterday, as some of you know, the day was dedicated to education justice. The key project was School Under a Tree, the Estudio Citac by architects Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Petty, that was held the previous week in Tepotztlan with the participation of 11 aliados, or collaborators. The studio was inspired by Campus in Camps, a school in Daesh refugee camp on the West Bank in Palestine that has been established by Sandy and Alessandro. Against a background of rampant violence where the state strangles its own citizens, or in the case of Palestine, the refugees from the state, School Under Tree focused on a discussion around notions of exception versus a normalization, prompted by a situation in the refugee camp where no normalization is equated with an endorsement of state-driven policies, resulting in the paradoxical condition of a permanent state of, temper of a temporary situation. A similar paradox results from the lack of private property in the refugee camps that complicates constructions of houses, for instance, that, that are internally um, labeled shelters. As a result, the question of decolonization of territory, but more importantly of thinking, reverberated throughout the day. Sandy and Alessandro described how such a dilemma leads to a situation of suspense that was quite literally encapsulated in a previous school under a tree in Brazil this past fall, where a Balba tree was literally hanging in the air, marking the spot where that particular school and its participants congregated every day. 
At our school under a tree in Kibbutzlan, it was the Saiba tree that played a similar role. And um, the Aliados described really quite captivatingly yesterday how the tree served in Kibbutzlan as well as a marker of season, climate, and time. And I think we'll see that is relevant for our discussion today again. In the presentations yesterday, in the afternoon, we returned to the title of the conference, um, Arte Justamente, the question of ethics and art, and the closeness and overlaps of the fields of aesthetics, education, law, and politics, or lack of overlap. A demand was made for a more nuanced uh, registry of justice and, um, and of art. In her keynote address, Suzanne Lacey um, brought these areas together, focusing, for instance, on the right to political education and the potential of chore choreographed conversations that can lead to new forms of pedagogy. The day was framed um, by a keynote for the entire conference delivered by journalist and writer Lydia Caccio, calling on our communality, which was echoed by um, Jaime Martinez Luna's poem in the mid, uh, middle of the day, and by closing address um, delivered by educator Pietra Melio on useful knowledge, social infantilization, bodies as weapons, and the various articulation of profound rupture in Mexican society at the moment. I very much look forward to revisiting these topics today, but particularly tomorrow at the what we labeled the closing council, a conversation with some of the presenters and with, we hope, all of you at two o'clock. The conversations and the discussions will also be captured in the forthcoming publication. Today, we are looking at notions of justice as it pertains to food, natural resources, crop cultivation, and food traditions. The questions are not that far off from yesterday's food too is a system of knowledge where myriads of crops must, uh, constitute multifaceted, complex, malleable systems of accumulated information or, as Pieter would have it, knowledge, and experience that pertain to soil, climate, customs, culture, technology, and people. The discussion today will focus on how to do justice to the various constituents of these systems, which are people, but they are also non-human uh, beings, the earth itself and physical elements. There is broad agreement that the issue of what we eat and who is empowered by it has gained international urgency due to population, control, uh, ex population explosion, envi uh, environmental crises, and deep income inequality, where the richest 1% will control over 50% of global wealth by 2016. That is next year, and it so happens that uh, someone yesterday also brought up this pronouncement uh, delivered by Oxfam at the beginning of last week. Knowledge by local communities and access and control over local agricultural products and procedures sits squarely against corporate and government interests in large-scale, financially lucrative food production. Key terms in this struggle that plays out internationally in various incarnations are food autonomy and food sovereignty versus industrial or transgenic crop production. I cannot think of an artwork that better locates the crux of these issues than the scene of the crime, the 40-minute film that we are about to see. And I cannot think of a wiser man to elaborate on the complexities than Amar Kanwar, the filmmaker. The video is from 2011 and presents areas of, east, of the eastern state of Odessa in India that are slated for mining exploitation by the Indian government or by corporations. Here, the Indian situation is mirrored by the rousing debates over transgenic corn and the defense of native seeds, um, in, especially in Oaxaca, where the first SDVC talk took place with Amar Kanwar in October. That was hosted by the Centro de las Artes um, in, um, thank you, San Agustin, Etla, and La Cordilleria in Oaxaca. And I'd like to express my deep appreciation to those two organizations, and in particular, Lourdes Reyes at Casa and Monica Villegas at La Cordilleria. Before I hand the podium over to Amar, let me just briefly mention a very few biographical facts 
about his um, professional life. He's based in New Delhi, has numerous um, exhibitions to his name. His works have been shown in biennials uh, throughout the world, in museums in Europe, the States, and uh, Asia. He is one of the few artists who has participated at Three Documentas, um, which is the significant uh, international survey of important issues that happens every five years in Germany. And this work in particular was presented at Documenta 13. His films have been screened at numerous festivals, um, at the 5th International Documentary and Short Film Festival in Kerala, for instance, Documentary Dream Show in Tokyo, The Parallel Perspective Festival in Hyderabad, and many, many other places. Um, Amar is the recipient of numerous awards. The most recent one has been the Amber Prize for Art and Social Change that was bestowed on him by Creative Time in 2014. He is the recipient of an honorary doctorate degree from Maine College of Art in Portland, Maine, and um, awards such as the Edward Monk Award for Contemporary Art from Norway, an MacArthur Fellowship in India, the Golden Gate Award from the San Francisco International Film Festival, etc., etc. So, um, I'm very glad you're here, and I'm delighted that Amar is here. Please help me welcome you to the stage. Sovereign Forest is, uh, as a project, is still uh, very often, it, I mean, every time I think it's over, uh, it feels like it's begun again. And so in, in a way, I could say that it is like a work in progress, and it's very kind of hesitatingly uh, grown. And there are a lot of friends uh, who have collaborated, uh, mainly uh, Sudhir Patnayak from and the Samadrishti team in Orissa, Shala, the student. Samira Jain, Dilip Burma. Step by step, actually, every time we've grown, uh, there have been consultations and consultations, and all of these friends have actually put in a lot of themselves into uh, this project and, in, in a way, taken it and brought it to where it is now. Uh, I'll very briefly kind of introduce the context and say a few words uh, before I begin uh, reading. Uh, the text of my presentation. Uh, when I first went to uh, Orissa, uh, this was uh, in the late 90s, in I think about 97, 98, and um, one of the kind of methods that I used to identify where I, I wanted to get out, I wanted to see what was happening, and I was just tracking meetings, you know, meetings of, that were taking place between government officials and corporations. Uh, CEOs or representatives of international companies and governments uh, visiting India, going to different places. And it was hard to figure out why were these people going to uh, various parts of the country where normally they would not go to. And in a sense, you know, I started to plot these, just where the meetings were taking place. And uh, in the mid-90s, late-90s. And uh, after a while, if you put just very basic kind of information together, uh, you could see that uh, there were several such meetings that were taking place in the coastal areas, in the Alpines, uh, and uh, definitely in the state of Odisha. And uh, it didn't take too long to try to figure out why these meetings were taking place. And these were agreements being formed, these were memorandum of understandings uh, being written, 
uh, between companies from various places. So uh, I went uh, to most of these areas, but I also went to Orissa in the late 90s, just to see, uh, to understand and see what was happening, and subsequently to film. Uh, I remember you know, one of the first things uh, that I saw, for instance, and I, I do remember was in, 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 in the rural part of Orissa, was, uh, you know, a, like a road that began nowhere and went to nowhere. I mean, there was a fully formed tarmac road uh, in the rural area, but there was nothing at the beginning of it and nothing at the end of it. And uh, uh, the ostensible reason given for, uh, for the construction of that road was to assist minor forest producers of indigenous communities to come out and go to the market and accessibility of the market and so on. But over, over three or four years, uh, in, in about two or three years, it became quite clear that this road was actually built. Uh, if you superimposed uh, sites of al aluminium smelters or uh, mining uh, sites, the road was actually to fit in with future industrial mapping. Um, just very briefly to give you an idea, again, one of the things that I, I saw and learned immediately at that time was that um, you had, uh, you know, overnight almost, you had communities who were living next to a river for uh, centuries or uh, generations, getting to know that, uh, you know, point A to point B in the river had been leased out to a company for several decades. Or that the, hand, the, the, the hill range that they were uh, living by or uh, below or adjacent to had again been leased out uh, for 90 years, 70 years to a cartel of companies. And it's not one hill range, but it's it's many, many, many hill ranges. And in, in a sense, very very soon, uh, the, the, the scale of the operation began to be clear. Um, in many places that you went, again, I saw uh, holes, you know, drilling holes uh, all over the place for surveying drilling holes. And uh, this was not just one factory or this was not just one mine or one power plant, but this was uh, um, 20, 30 uh, uh, of all of it in all over the place. So this was in some senses seemed to be the beginning of uh, quite an enormous land grab in a way. Uh, the other thing that struck me at that time was that uh, there were many hamlets of farming communities or of indigenous communities who had been already resisting very, very powerful companies and cartels, working with the state government, working with the police, working with the administration for five, six years already, um, and, and uh, resisting and preventing their lands from being taken over. Uh, and what was striking was that many of these communities didn't seem to have a formal political organization or a formal structure. Uh, didn't seem to have any very clear leaderships in that sense. Uh, there was no outside organization, there were no outside political parties working. And then in many ways, these were communities that, had, uh, that were resisting for quite some time against a lot of odds on their own, uh, which was quite surprising to me. Uh, what was also surprising was that I found that they were, they, maybe they were not very well informed about what was beginning to happen, uh, but they had understood it in another way uh, and understood it very intelligently. I remember uh, really early on, um, a, 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 young, a young boy, uh, in a tribal and indigenous uh, young boy from, from South Odisha, he, he was at pains to, to explain something, and he spoke very simply, but it hurt uh, to hear him. And I remember his words exactly, and he said, um, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a skull, he said. Uh, Do you know a skull? So I said, yes. And he said, it, inside the skull, there's a brain. You know, there's a brain? So I said, yes. And he said, well, this brain can think. And essentially, what he was trying to say was that they can think, they can analyze, they can compare, they can, they can see uh, that 
30 years ago you built a dam for irrigation and now the, what the, the, the irrigation reservoir was being redirected to an aluminium smelter. Uh, you were redisplacing again, you were retaking over lands. And so uh, there's a, they do not need anybody from outside to inform them about the meaning of this struggle. I also ran into uh, a leadership outside the hamlets across the state which also attracted me, which was the leadership that was in a sense capable of working and actually working with a fairly wide spectrum of resistances from uh, extreme left, uh, underground left to Gandhian to the, to the whole spectrum in between as well. So from armed and unarmed non-violent struggles as well. Um, in, in, in many ways, um, the sovereign forest actually, actually, in a sense, surfaced much, much later, almost 10 years later. And so I worked, I made films, I traveled, I did many things uh, as a filmmaker, as an activist, as a teacher. Uh, but no doubt the scale and severity of what was happening was enormous. And uh, it was only around, uh, you know, 2009, 2000. 2008-9 that I started to think that I needed to work in, in another way and, and, and that's when the Sovereign Forest started to kind of take shape. Uh, most of the time I at least feel about my own work, I feel extremely kind of doubtful and hesitant. And uh, it's always been one small step at a time, again a consultation and a small step and a consultation and a small step. And a whole lot of questions just keep gathering and I keep trying to address these questions through my work in some way or the other. Uh, for, because of, in some sense, trying to keep within the time span that we have, I'm going to read the rest of my presentation and um, begin with a set of questions. Um, well, the only thing I'd like to say is that after making a set of films, at a certain point I felt like stepping back. And that's where I start. If every moment contains the possibility of being alive and being dead, then could an acute awareness of every moment also create an acute consciousness of living and dying? It is always possible to be able to distinguish between each breath, to be able to perceive every single inhalation and exhalation. It is also possible that this may happen without a reduction in the speed or rate of breathing. The precision of this perception about a recurring ordinary event can dramatically impact the awareness of one's own existence and a unique unity with the self emerges. Finite and infinite time are experienced together and all senses seem to transform. Words begin to sound different, every touch becomes special, new smells are experienced, all relationships change and in a while the world can be recognized anew. In the same way, it is possible, or is it, it is possible to distinguish between each look but can this be done without a reduction in the speed or rate of looking? Will the experience of the separation of each glance also result in a separation of the perception of what each glance is looking at? If that were possible, then would these distinct perceptions dramatically alter our awareness of our own existence and transform the way we see the world around us? Would we then begin to see a new that which lies within each image, each object, and all beings. Would a spectrum of inner narratives then emerge? Would the fluidity of these narratives give us a unique insight into the temporary, temporariness around us? If a crime continues to occur, regardless of the enormous evidence available, then is the crime invisible? or the evidence invisible, or are both visible but not seen? The moment you ask this question, another set of questions emerge. What is the scene of crime? What is its footprint? 
Is the crime always a single cataclysmic event or is it also something that expands and is an accumulating process? And which vocabulary has more capability to understand the scale and extent of a crime? Or if I were to say it in another way, if I do not understand the meaning of loss, its scale, its extent, its multiple dimensions, how then could I even know what it is that is lost? Central to the notion of crime is the question of evidence. When you look at any crime, it is investigated by an agency, which is the police or the criminal justice system of any society. Subsequently, only evidence which is defined as permissible by law is allowed to be presented in court. All other evidence is dismissed as invalid. The carefully crafted text of the law tells us which evidence is permissible and which is not. And then finally, it is only the permissible evidence that is used to see, analyze and conclude formally on the crime, the responsibility and therefore justice. But what if the definition of what is permissible or, or is, is itself incorrect? If that definition of what is permissible evidence is wrong in the first place, then maybe what the judges are getting is not necessarily the correct or full picture of the crime. So perhaps it is useful or necessary to ask, who defines evidence? Who defines validity? What is the vocabulary of a language that can talk about a series of simultaneous disappearances occurring across multiple dimensions of our lives? How to see, know, understand and remember these, different, these disappearances? And so I make the proposition just to see for a while and say, will you permit me not only metaphorically and not only symbolically but also formally and specifically. Will you permit me to present poetry as evidence in a criminal or political trial? Please place it side by side with your official, formal, permissible, legally valid evidence and see. see what is it that you understand about the crime? What is the difference? And do we all get another perspective? And therefore, in a way, the sovereign forest became that kind of experiment, where slowly and step by step, multiple kinds of invalid evidence accumulated around the scene of crime, in varied forms and vocabularies, but with real cases, real situations, and in the context of the great land grab that is undergoing in contemporary India. I do not deny the value of forensic investigation and I'm requesting actually for a dynamic relationship alongside it and outside the limits of a factual ontology with a hope to reconfigure the question of evidence and therefore perhaps of the nature of comprehension as well. There was a time when the testimony, even in flux, and ever-changing, the anecdote with its insights, the experience with its unprinted wisdom was all central to the exploration and expression of truth. Everything else was added on to that knowledge. In essence, the sovereign forest attempted to bring the non-forensic back to the center of discourse. And the only way to do this was to experiment with ways of seeing, showing, perceiving, and the opening up of, and a dialogue within, a multiplicity of senses. Loss must have, it seems, I presume, perhaps, quite obviously, its own unique language. And so the first step was just to step back a little, free oneself from the super articulation or the slate of hand and tongue and intention and simply look at the scene of crime. The central film in the Sovereign Forest, titled The Scene of Crime, became therefore an experience of landscape just prior to erasure 
as territories marked for acquisition by industries. Almost every image in this film lies within specific territories that are proposed industrial sites and are in the process of being acquired by government and corporations in Orissa and also sites of strong resistance. Every location, every blade of grass, every water source, every tree that is seen in the film is now meant to not exist anymore. The scene of crime became an experience of looking at the terrain of this conflict and the personal lives that exist within this natural landscape. Over time, more films, fables, books, texts, stories, documents, photographs, and several other things collected around the film. Each form of evidence or poetry opened newer and newer dimensions and therefore newer comprehensions of the same crime. With multiple entry points and routes, sometimes these varied comprehensions suddenly synchronize in the mind and in the body. And that was what I had hoped for. However, what happens if we take the scene of crime and its evidence to the actual scene of crime? Those who live in the scene of crime are likely to say, thank you, it's a very sensitive and beautiful insight you have created about what we are experiencing. However, it is not enough. There is far more to understand because only we know what it really means to live in the scene of crime. Suddenly, the inadequacy of the work gets foregrounded. But because it has been a long process of being there, making it, of consulting, of working and relationships, we all then became continuously entangled with this inadequacy. The moment we identify this inadequacy, we are all compelled, driven, required to respond to it. And we will respond in varied ways. Sometimes with more evidence, more forms of interpretation, and also possibly with a new unfolding narrative of the contemporary. And then another memory of the present may begin to emerge. But when this constellation of evidence gets collected, we are all faced with another dilemma. What do we do with this evidence? Where do we keep it? How to relate to it? Should we protect it? And if so, how do we protect it? And for how long? If we have to keep it somewhere, then so a space needs to be found to be able to present this evidence. And the moment you find a space, we actually become an art space. And the moment we become an art space, we are totally confused, because is this an art space, or is this a public trial, or is this a library, or is this an archive, but it feels like a shrine. And so in many ways we slowly let it grow, and let the confusion and clarity and the different perceptions of what it is also grow. Sometimes the space felt like a school, and sometimes it would feel like an art installation, and often neither as well. The knowledge inside poetry of non-forensic evidence imprinted in objects, oral history, experiences and landscapes is intrinsic to the structure and form of the installation. The multiplicity of forms and vocabularies leads us to unlikely juxtapositions and dialogues. For instance, one such connection was between cinema and seas. The knowledge and possession of seeds indicates a way of how to think about institutions as fluid forms of knowledge related to ancestral histories, to practical tools, medicinal applications and cultural histories. This also points to the autonomous and self-governed role of such institutions for the future dissemination and preservation of organic material. At the heart of the sovereign forest, alongside the film of the scene of crime, are 272 species of rice presented as evidence, each with their own name, properties and weather resistances, revealing Orissa's agricultural diversity and rich tradition of seed cultivation. A tangible index of a vast, almost intangible, fluid knowledge system. 
It is the achievement of an old farmer, Nagparsaran, who has taken upon himself, like several others, to organically collect, cultivate, disseminate, regenerate, and archive this unique heritage. Nagpur Sarangi and his nursery have become the seed bank in a region that has an age-old history of agricultural diversity. Stunning by their sheer number and diversity, these different species of rice address the issues of biodiversity and livelihood, which are part of the search and the constantly growing archive connected to the sovereign forest. Since the biodiversity materialized within these different seeds results from centuries of growth, wisdom, and specific adaptation, the different species of rice have inherited different resistances to disease, they answer specific nutritional needs or cultural needs, and are adapted to the specific environments that they derive from. How would you calculate them, the value of this knowledge? How can you compensate it if it is lost? Would you calculate by the length and breadth and the price of the property at that point in time, when you take away this land, how would you calculate what you lost? What meaning is produced within a collection of seeds? What kind of histories do they carry? What kind of agencies do seeds develop and thus the institutions created for their preservation and protection? How are loss, memory and experience imprinted in the seeds? What do they inform us about the questions of sovereignty? These are only some of the serious questions that spin off from one, only one set of evidence in the sovereign forest. Art should, if I may say so, and if I could use the word should, be able to relate to the fluid fragility of our time. And if so, then, should the, then so should the institutions that emerge from art. In many ways, the Sovereign Forest as an installation was also making a clear proposition for exploring multiple forms of institution making. In the way it has been conceived, the methodology of its presentation, and more importantly, in the form of its display. And we seek to address all institutions, the seed bank, the school, the cinema, the museum, and the nation. The experiences so far raises yet another series of questions. Can we think conceptually about the form of institutions in the same way as we have traditionally understood nature, common properties, natural resource management systems, and knowledge tradition that are adjusted, refined, passed on, and developed over decades? Or more precisely, can processes be institutions? Can an institution be a consistent but strategic series of experiments with ideas, research, events, and conversation and agreements? Does the institution always need to be visible? Can it and have assets and a permanent singular identity? Can an institution appear and disappear? Is it prepared, capable, flexible to find a new form to exist? Can it exist in camouflage occasionally? It does come down to how we look how we perceive. A certain way of looking creates a certain kind of understanding, which in turn creates a certain kind of compassion. You may think a nomad has no home. Someone else may say that is not true. A nomad has a home. It's just that you don't see it. The nomad carries his home as he travels. A string of islands may also seem to be floating in isolation but it could also counter the so-called absolute homogeneous continent. A film is a series of still images. Time passes through them, and only then the images begin to move. But does time only move in one way? The deliberate maintenance of a regenerating, multiplying oral culture can also be a strategy deployed against a fascist state. When the sovereign forest changes from an art installation to a school, it becomes the academy of doubt. Just as we invite people to contribute evidence to understand the crime, to understand in fact all life, the academy of doubt also invites everyone to make its curriculum. <coughs> there is a tree in the middle of a vast circle of rice fields. The tree is surrounded by tall thin grass that is so still that they seem like frozen lines. 
This tree exists adjacent to the Academy of Doubt. When the wind blows, they dance in every direction, creating a sound that enters even through the skin. As the sun rises and burns our shoulders, everyone moves towards it. Next to the tree is a little house. When you step inside, you see that it is filled with seeds, each with their own first names. By the seeds are photographs of those who have disappeared but are not yet dead. The newspaper is there, is there and so are all the notebooks with their wandering columns. Also loose sheets of paper with hundreds of thumbprints and signatures. Here you will find several land deeds, tax receipts and maps that float in the air and a basket that collects the flowers that fall from the tree. The walls are filled with thousands of floating images, old, older, oldest images, the now, just now images, and the new, newer, newest images, all replacing each other in a random regularity. And right across the floor is a wooden bench. The bench is made up of small pieces of wood from nine trees. The tree of rain, the tree of death, the tree of sparrows and tubers, the tree of ancestors, the tree of hallucinations, the tree of the nomad, the tree of exile, the tree of insurgency, and the tree with no name. One day, a carpenter needed stools. He went to Nidhan's house, but Nidhan had not yet returned. He took the bench out and measured it carefully, divided it by three, marked the three parts and then cut it. He unlocked all the parts of the bench and remade them into three stools. When he finished, he looked at the stools and was surprised to find that they had instead become three large books. He smiled. It had been a long time since something like this had happened to him. He decided to take apart the books and make a boot. I think I should stop here because a new journey begins now. The new journey about what happened to the boat, where did they go in the boat. A new journey about the counting sisters and the one alone. The counting sisters who count the dead and the one alone who never forgets with the unique memory of all plants. We now show the film, The Scene of Crime. It's a slow, 42-minute long film, and I hope you enjoy watching it. Thank you.